Hello everybody, King Nelib Reviews here, and today we're going to be doing a chapter review on Witch Hat Atelier Chapter 43. Now, I really did enjoy this chapter, and I don't really do chapter reviews enough, and that got to change, so this is my first step to that. In this video, I'll be putting it into three main parts, I'll say. First one will be just me going over my initial reactions or thoughts into it. My second will be just kind of breaking down and analyzing the major kind of points that the Wingaka is trying to do with the series. And then my last would be expectations moving forward in the series. If you do end up enjoying the video, make sure you do like, comment, and subscribe. It goes a long way. But which had I tell you? Let's talk about it. Everybody get your fucking hands up. So this witch hat chapter is pretty much separated into three main parts. The first part will be the part with Kustis and Tartar. We saw how they met up and why Tartar actually feels for Kustis. The second part was talking about Origuo. He wants to make an invention, but it didn't go through. And he's explaining why. And that pretty much helps um, explain just how the world works in you know the magic society that they live in. And then the last part was Coco's interactions with Kustis and how that went which i really liked so three main parts overall pretty long chapter but the chapter was good i really did enjoy it so let's get to my first thoughts while i was reading the chapter okay so the first scene the one with kustis and tartar from what we've seen kustis was trying to run away from a band of thieves and he ends up breaking the legs of his magic chair last time we saw kustis we knew his legs were injured and because of this injury, of course, he's going to need some different mode of transportation apart from his legs. And it seems like it will be this magic chair, which, of course, I just said it broke. And then the thieves, it seems like they were trying to kidnap him and maybe sell the chair for a high price. But um, they, you know, they broke it. So now that's just a missing opportunity for them. And to release their rage for losing out, they tried to actually attack Kustis. That's when Tartar came in. Tartar kind of read the situation and he's just like, oh, you know, if, if you guys are thieves just trying to, you know, cause trouble, I'll call a witch over. And he he bluffs to call a witch over, but the thieves end up running away. And then Tartar, you know, meets um, Kustis, you know, helps him up. Kustis explains that, you know, these are his new legs and they're broke. How's he going to live? Tartar ends up, you know, with no magic, just uses adhesive glue, you know, and then through that, he ends up, um, solving, well, not solving, but fixing Tartar's chair and solving his problem. And, you know, they share names, and then that's pretty much the start of their their journey together. And as we see, they're pretty, pretty close. So you can tell that Tartar really helped Kustis, and Kustis sees him in a very positive light. So then we move on to the next scene with Krifri and Origuo. So next, we get into the scene with Krifri and Origuo. Now, Quifri, he's still hurt. We see him trying to sweep, but, you know, his back hurts, so it's not going well. They warned him to, you know, take care of himself better. And Origio is saying that he, he, he'll just take over and sweep, you know, so Quifri doesn't have to worry. And Quifri asks him, like, aren't you busy? And then he explains that he his recent invention, which is a fake flame, didn't go through and it was rejected. And then Coco is pretty confused, like, yo, like, why didn't it go through? And then they start explaining. They say that, you know, the fake flame, it won't burn or scald you even if you touch it. It looks exactly like a normal light or a normal flame, but it won't burn up, cause a fire, or it won't run out of fuel and be extinguished. So it's basically a very convenient fake flame. And then, of course, it's, it, it sounds fire. Well, <laughs> it sounds fire, but um, it's like, it's too good. You know, the fake flame is too good that people might actually mistake a real flame for the fake flame so they explain that kids that see the um they see the fake flame you know they can touch it grab it do all this now when they go to a real flame they're like oh the last flame i touched i could just you know touch and grab it so they try to do it on a real flame and they can end up with permanent injuries and you know cause very very heavy damage and we don't know how many kids who end up falling for that so they start explaining that even um, even if adults tell them that, hey, fire is bad, but then the next day they're grabbing like Origio's flames and then playing with them, it's very contradictory. So not all kids will be able to make the correct decision when it comes to 
the flames. So Orgio and Quiff explain that and they explain how, you know, they have to be really responsible with how they handle magic because magic, as Quiff said, can fundamentally reshape the world. So everything they make, they have to really un um, worry about the effects they can have for the people that can use magic. So I really enjoyed this talk, you know, because it goes to show just how beautiful this world is and just how like um, complicated things can be. You know, you can just use magic really silly. Like you really got to understand what you're doing to people. And in order to keep magic a secret too, everyone has to be on the same page. So this chapter really helped that idea. And I love that um, the Mingaka is really putting an effort to expand the world and expand its rules. So seeing the kids um, react to it, you know, because even Coco knows, she comments that um, she, of course, know how horrible, well, for better or for worse, magic can change. And, of course, after what happened to her, her mother, she knows how horrible magic could be. So, like I said, that talk, great, great, great talk. One of my favorite talks, to be honest. And then they go to check on Tartar's um, gramps. And then, of course, through how Tartar's gramps were talking, Coco realized that Tartar really didn't tell um his granddad about how about him you know working with the herbal medicine with kustis and of course that makes her feel un uneasy but they and she ends up going to tartar and then that leads us to our next scene so coco goes down to meet kustis and kustis is learning with tartar about magical herbs then they start talking and kustis starts giving a small little backstory about him being a merchant of dagda he explains that him and Dagda used to, you know, do dance and sing instruments for, for, for money. And, of course, Kusta says that that's an old job since currently him being injured, he can't perform like he used to. And he says that all his instruments were swept away in the river. And honestly, when I read the scene way back, you know, with his stuff being swept in the river, I thought it was something like some like rice or like, you know, some food got swept. So I was really hard on Kustis for going back to get those things that were swept away. But now that I know what they were and how much it means to them, I really do understand him, you know, trying to risk getting the instruments back, even if it's kind of dangerous. But of course, it didn't turn out well and he ends up injured. And of course, they, the witch is not healing him. Didn't help at all. But we learned that the instruments were very costly and the treatment is costly too. He, Kustis explains that if Dagda could just give up on him and not do the treatment, he'll be able to buy new instruments and be able to live like they used to. But of course, Dagda's a soft soul and does love Kustis, so he wouldn't take that route. And um, Coco asks if Dagda's his dad, and he explains that Dagda is his family, you know, his master, his partner, pretty much is everything. He's very appreciative and lucky he met Dagda, and he wants to lighten his load as much as possible. Because Kustis getting injured wasn't Dagda's fault, but Dagda's now compromised because of what happened. And Kustis doesn't feel good about it at all. So he, he wants to, you know, learn herbs, ends up selling it, and make some money. And then um, Tartar starts talking about the future, saying that, you know, if he can read a book, if he can read the book by himself in the future, he can get more jobs. But Kustis isn't worried about the future. He's worried about right now because he's not growing up in the atelier surrounded by you know companions and a, and a master you know he he's from the slums he has to make money now or he can't live to see next week and he even says that tartar you guys are witches you have a future me someone from the slums he has to earn as much as he can every year so he says that he's probably going to grow up working as hard as he can every single year and that's just how he's going to live and die and of course um coco who wasn't born a witch, right? She tries to console him by saying, you know, even if you're not born a witch, there's still opportunities you can. And Kus doesn't even let her finish. You know, in the middle of his statement, he just looks at her in a very, very, like, I don't even know what to describe that look. But he's just like, of course you would say that. You know, someone with schooling, someone with a house, someone that didn't have to worry about food, money, and magic powers. Like, you're saying that, you know, possibilities are everywhere, but you don't know how I live. You know, you weren't on my side. You guys are on your own lane. I'm on this lane. And of course, he doesn't know that Coco was, I won't say just like him, because Coco wasn't from the slums, but Coco is definitely powerless, even though she has power now. And 
Coco isn't allowed to say this. So it really does come off as ignorant, even though she is someone that used to be like, who's this? And made it up. So this talk was really, really good. And I did enjoy it a lot. So Kustis ends up leaving. And then Coco puts the pieces together that Tartar is helping Kustis because Tartar was in a similar position with his eye disease. And then now Kustis is disabled with his legs instead of his eyes. And then Tartar wants to just provide um, a, a new way for Kustis to move forward since Kustis feels powerless right now, which I really do respect. There, Tartar has no reason to do this, but he really is going out of his way to do this. So I do respect Tartar a lot for that. So him and Coco ends up making a plan to, you know, change Tartar's world. And I'm honestly curious to see what, you know, what's going to happen and how they're going to do it. You know, Coco always comes up with some great ideas and her and the Tartar combo, that's going to be some fire. So that's what I'm waiting for. So now let's get to the analysis part of the video. Okay, let's start with the first scene. There's not too much to say about the first scene, so I'm not going to waste your time. But there are two key things that the Mingaka use to help emphasize the point they're trying to make. And that is, number one, Kustis is now being the... He's now being used to show how the rules of the magic society is affecting humans and affecting them badly. And I do like this because I feel like the story is shifting to a point where we're going to really question if these rules and regulations that magic society has put into place is actually needed or is it justifiable? Because Kustis is someone that these magicians can heal. The witches can heal this guy. We've seen it back then. They did healed like the flags and everything. The flag was burnt and then they did it by the back. And they would even give Kusta just proper, you know, some proper aid to, you know, fix his legs. And now we're seeing how he has to live his life because those higher up um, witches didn't want to heal him. And as you see, Kustis is not living a good life whatsoever. You know, because of their actions, Kustis is now living like this. So because, of course, they met Kustis before and now we're seeing how he's living now. This is a really, really good way for the readers to understand that. These witches and their rules, not not too, like, the rules aren't meant for everyone to prosper. You know, it's really to protect them and their secret. So, I really like how Eustace, um, how Kustis is being used here. And Tartar fixing his chair without magic. You know, he just used adhesive glue. You know, that's all he used. And that also goes to show that you don't necessarily need magic to kind of solve everything. And... Because he's doing it to someone without magic, you know, Kustis. Because Kustis can find that he's a glue himself. You know, of course, it'll be hard with his legs. But the main point is, this is a good way to kind of give Kustis like a path to um, kind of fix his problems, you know. Because, of course, being powerless, not having magic, and on top of that, being disabled with your legs, is very rough. And... Tartar, you know, even if it's just, it just one step forward, you know, being able to just heal his broken chair with no magic, just normal glue, that's good overall because it shows that a lot of these problems don't have, you know, you don't need magic to solve a lot of these problems. Some of them can be solved just by using your brains and just having the right tools, you know, for the right job. Now, the meat of the chapter was definitely the next scene with Origuo, and let's move on to that. Now, the Origuo scene was really, really, really good. And it's really good because people got to understand that when it comes to keeping these secrets, right? It is a very, very hard secret to keep because magic is accessible to literally everybody. As long as you have the right ink and you know the, the symbols you have to draw, you can do magic. So because of that, it's so hard to honestly keep this a secret. So the fact that they kept this secret for so long, there must be a ton and a ton and a ton of rules that made it possible. Of course, we're seeing where the witches are located. So one of them is even under the sea, you know. So um, as the story goes on, we, we learn more and more and more about how they're getting it done. And this is a great way to show how the human world is pretty much still kept isolated from the witch world. And with stuff like 
banning you know items like the fake flame which doesn't temper with the human world that kind of gives justification to what the witches are doing because as we just saw last scene we saw the problems witches can cause for normal people and we see in this scene we actually saw the benefit and the witches actually looking out for normal people by not tempering with how you know their future kids will grow, will grow up thinking i really like this chapter because it's really good for the world building you know seeing just like what they're allowed and not allowed to do and it makes perfect sense you know and i love that they actually thought this far ahead because me i would have definitely just passed it i've been oh fake flame that's cool pass but of course they're looking way deeper they're saying yo this could really affect people i already explained earlier how you know the fake flame would really ruin you know a, a child growing up but i really do like that they took in, they took this into consideration you know, because Agate was even explaining that, you know, it's not the it's not the inventor's fault, you know. So, you know, why why should they be the ones getting their reject um the inventions rejected? And as we see, they said it would just be irresponsible. You know, or or Jiro is saying that I'm I'm here to help people, you know, it'll be irresponsible for me to take that risk that a child out there could see my flame and end up getting hurt by real flames by mistaking it for mine. So I, I do like this, you know, this ongoing theme of which is like the balance between which is honestly being there for the people. Because the, the main point of being a witch was to help people. But of course, with the witch police and how they move, they're more they're more so trying to protect themselves and protect their own magic. You know, the order. They're not really protecting humans. So I, I like that balance. You know, our main group is the let's protect everybody and then the witch police is more you know keep the order even if the order can lead to very disadvantages um disadvantageous um situations for normal people and the last scene was with kustis and what i like about kustis is that like i said earlier he represents you know the he represents how a human could end up after an encounter with a witch, you know, Coco just said, you know, magic can be good or bad. And not only did he lose everything in that flood, but he also lost his legs and it didn't get healed. And then because of that, he's not stuck in a situation where, because he was already living so poorly and the witches has made it way worse. And Dagda, bro, Dagda is one of the realest people I've seen, bro. The fact that he still kept Kustis, regardless of, you know, his condition, and just seeing them, I, I think I cried here when, um, you know, Kustis came back all bloody and just like, y'all bloody, they do another, another dangerous job. And, you know, he said, it can't be helped. I have to make funny to, you know, handle both of us. And then Kustis is in his arms crying, saying, just, just throw me away. Leave me behind so you can be fine. And of course, Dagda is just not going to do that. And then Tartan Coco is just listening behind the wall, just like, wow, you know, like, we know this guy we we know he was you know unfortunate circumstance with witches and then now his life is just life's just in the mud and it's, it's truly unfortunate but i really like that scene like i said because coco too she she's put in a situation where she can understand and empathize no she can sympathize with Kusa's situation because they both weren't born without magic you know they both were powerless, but she was one of the extreme rare cases where she was actually introduced into the world of magic. So she could, she has both perspectives, you know, whereas Tartar, and I mean, in Kustis's eyes, she's been born with magic. And Coco can say no, because if honestly, if Coco, if Tar, if Kustis knew Coco was born without magic, he might have had a lot more um, inspiration from her because he's like, you know, she she found a way, you know, she really found a way to just learn magic. That's that's an insane feat for normal humans in this world. So but of course, to him, she's just born in magic. And then she's trying to tell him that, oh, there's even without magic, you know, you, there are many possibilities. And he's just like pretty know about living without magic. You know, he's saying he's here legless, you know, living in the slums, making Dagda doing these dangerous missions and. It's, it's just a really unfortunate situation. And I, and I like this for Coco because Coco's always put in a situation where she she thinks on both sides. You know, she's, because she wasn't born in the witch's world, she has a 
interesting and refreshing perspective when it comes to situations. And this is a good one because this is one where her, her both sides of her perspective is honestly hindering or getting in the way of what she wants. Because usually someone like Tatia or Rishi or Agathe would never say, even if you're born of our magic, there's still possibilities because they don't know what it's like to be born of our magic. You know, Coco was born of our magic and she knew that there's still possibilities out there because she used one of those possibilities to become a witch. You know, she, she, she opened a door that almost no one else could open that led to the world of magic. So, but of course she can't say it because of the rules and regulations. And because of that, she's not put in a compromising position when it comes to her relationship with Kustis. So I, I really love how this chapter really went over the kind of rules of like the witches and how it's affecting people you know because it's, it's been this way for a while i've I was reading the series it's really been in this way for a while and i love these chapters that really emphasize it and the last thing is i really do enjoy the three like tartar acoustics and coco those three both of them in this current situation were they, they were all compromised at one point you know tartar had he, he has eye disease you know he can't really tell colors. And because of that, he says that, you know, that feeling where the future is closed off because of something you have no control over is really unbearably painful. Coco felt the same exact way when she wanted to learn magic, but literally she could not. You know, there's nothing she can do. She simply was born without magic, whereas other people could use the magic she always wanted to use. But what could Coco do about it? Coco just had to hold that. And Acousta is now currently can't use his legs he's hindered he has to move with his chair and because of that he can do the same dances and play the instrument that got him money so now he feels like his future was closed is closed off because of his health condition so all three of them at some point of their lives had a really really heavy condition that stopped them from believing that they had a the future they desired for themselves but used to, uh but tartar and coco has found the resolve to or found a way to kind of take that step to the future they've always dreamed of so now they want to bring kustas into that same world that they see so i'm really excited for what's coming up and yeah let's move on to the expectations now for expectations for the next chapter honestly i this chapter pretty much wrapped up like a good amount of stuff so unless we're gonna we're either gonna add more to you know the Kustis Coco Tartar situation, but I feel like we're gonna focus more on the festival. You know, I feel like the festival will be what we're gonna jump just jump right into it. You know, maybe mid chapter or a couple pages in, we start the festival. And I know I got there was wondering if a certain person was coming to that festival, and I feel like it's probably an older sibling, or maybe a senpai, or you know, just someone that probably looked down on her, or maybe someone that caused her to get fired from. Her family so um i feel like yeah we'll be starting the festival pretty soon and then that kind of plot line with agate maybe not next chapter but you know in the near future that's gonna come into play and of course oh brim hat invasion for sure we're definitely getting brim hats coming in and just doing some nonsense like they always show up <laughs> they're just they're they're really annoying but they're gonna show up and hopefully, I do want this Kustis thing solved. Not necessarily solved, but I do want them letting Kustis take his first steps within the next three chapters. It don't got to be the next chapter right away. That might be a bit too early. But maybe two, three, four chapters from now, they get like, you know, just something. They give him just something that he's able to use to, you know, make his step forward in his world. Because him and Dagda have definitely became some of my favorites in the series. So, yeah. Enjoyment-wise... Out of five stars, I'll, I'll give it like a, a four. A four. Really enjoyed the chapter. You know, chapter was really good. It did a lot. And yeah, I'm really excited for the next one. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you love more content, don't forget to hit the notification bell too to never miss my uploads. Thanks again, and I'll catch y'all later. Peace.